Assalamu alaikum everybody. Good morning. Welcome back to another episode of ETC Talks. I'm truly delighted to be with you all again and seeing new attendees for today's event. As a regular practice, few reminders. Before we begin, this session is recorded. Questions may be raised at the end of the discussion. Kindly keep your mic on mute. We have an interesting topic today to be delivered by an IT professional from IT Insight. Our guest speaker for today is a veteran IT professional with more than 22 years of experience in the field of networking, CRM, web, and security. He managed to lead the IT Insight company through 18 years of constant growth and accelerating momentum into one of the leading IT service providers in Oman. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Mr. Rashid Assalmi. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Thank you, Mahfouda. Thank you very much. Um, all right, I welcome you all as well. Um, we, we're go I'm going to try to make this uh, concise and go through one hour of uh, of presentation, as the topic actually can needs needs a lot more time to to cover. But uh, we will just try to touch up on the main topics. And um, I would also like to apologize, as I had a, a more recent presentation, but for some technical reasons we could not use it. So we're using an older version, which is missing some information. I will improvise on those slides where I need to. Uh, to uh, say more than what's there in the slide. Now, uh, to begin with, I, I would like to look into um, the, the, the current, uh, we can start with the current landscape. First of all, why are we talking uh, about contemporary uh, challenges in, in security? Why are there any contemporary challenges? So the current la landscape, uh, and I hope you all see this uh, screen. Do you see it, Mahfouda, there? Can you confirm? Yes, we see it, the current landscape. Uh, Yes, very good. Thank you. Then, um, very well. So, the, 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 there, there has been recently a, a, a growth in um, online transaction, uh, online transactions related to finance, related to personal use, and so on. And this uh, increase in transactions, or use, or internet use in this case, um, actually is very, can become very profitable to cyber criminals. Cyber criminals have been there for a long time, they've been around since the uh, 1960s, but uh, only in the recent uh, decade, uh, they may, maybe around 2010, 2005, that they have started to see a huge potential in uh, making a revenue uh, from the internet or the internet use, specifically from people who don't know how to use the internet properly or organizations which are not ready for internet in terms of security. Now, uh, along with that, these, these criminal um, organizations have, have been uh, created for profit, but then some states or some countries and organizations, bigger organizations, have started to sponsor these criminal groups and they started to destabilize business as we know, as we know it. The way we are doing business is, is changing very quickly. Now, add to that the growth of dark and deep web. I don't know, I think um, some of you might be familiar with the topic, but if you're not, then uh, dark web is the part of the internet which, is, which does not show on your search engine. If you search Google for data, Google only searches about 10% of the internet. The 90% deep internet, they cannot see. They cannot see that because they don't have permission to go there. Now, that is called a dark web. And there are ways to get there, but it's kind of risky, and then uh, there is no, no, it's a lawless land, basically. Uh, so dark, dark web has increased very uh, significantly uh, because of the demand on stolen data. So if I manage to steal information from a bank or a, a, any kind of organization, I can go and sell it on the dark web. And usually it fetches good amounts of money. Of course, I'll, be, I'll pay in Bitcoin or I'll receive my payment in Bitcoin. And this, therefore, we, I don't have much risk to worry about here. Then there is, of course, the social media exposures, which have really uh, devastated the way we're doing business again, uh, even the way we conduct our daily lives. 
uh, we are more prone to social engineering attacks now than before. So, for example, um, 10 years ago, it was really difficult to know, or 20 years ago, let's say, it was really difficult to know what are the hobbies or interests of any individual person. But today, this is really easy. You can just go to his Facebook account and you can find out a lot about his life, how he conducts things, how he does things. So this makes him a, an easy target for any, any pro professional attacker. People can use social engineering methods on these, on this kind of targets easily. Um, it, it, one last topic uh, uh, that is interesting in today's landscape is that, that there's a lack of security awareness, um, which has been um, a constant problem for more than 20 years now. A lot of organizations have moved a little bit forward in terms of awareness, but uh, the vast majority is still lagging. Some of them don't have the right resources, the right people to do it, or in some cases, even they don't have the procedure for it. So uh, for whatever reason it is, this is making it easier on attackers. The less educated the target is, the easier it is to, 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 to get them um, to submit. And um, again, it plays in the hands of the attackers. Now, the current threats, which everybody knows, um, are still persistent, they're still there. They have not disappeared, meaning that we still have direct attacks. We have denial of service attacks, advanced persistent threats, so many types of attacks which are, which entail usually a hacker breaking your um, perimeter firewall, going into your environment, trying to steal data directly from your database. Those are all still there. So those attacks are still around, but they are um, they are not as scary as they used to be. Um, our readiness to handle them is much better right now, but again, com combined with the, ne the other types of attacks, which we, which we always, which also persisted, it becomes a little bit risky. So other than direct attacks, we have social engineering attacks, which are rising. Last year, I think more than 80% of the attacks were related to phishing, related to social engineering activities, people sending you emails or SMS or WhatsApp, some form of communication to trap you into clicking somewhere or following a certain link. So this is basically one big issue we have to worry about, social engineering. It is growing really fast, apart from, of course, the physical social engineering, because a lot of people tend to break the rules in order to, 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 to be able to either do sur surveillance or, or attack organizations. Then there is, of course, the issue of malware. And malware has become intelligent now, and this is a big problem because uh, for many years we have known about some type of malware called polymorphic malware. Now, polymorphic malware, malware what it does, it, it changes from time to time. It changes its own signature so that antiviruses cannot catch it. That, is, that was the smartest type of malware we've known. Now we have malware which is 10 times more smarter than polymorphic viruses. They, the, the malware today not only uh, can be polymorphic, but it can also hide in, in plain sight. It can just hide and not do anything. It can stay in your environment for three months, just waiting for a, an AI system to communicate with it, or some, let's say, command and control center somewhere to communicate with it. These kinds of malware are becoming really, really, really common nowadays because everybody knows, or every attacker out there knows, that common viruses are easily caught by, by antivirus software. So they have to go really advanced with this. And because, as we said, there are uh, organize, organized crimes, uh, criminal gangs, basically, organized, uh, orga big organizations which are handling this, then they can afford to make intelligent malware. They keep on enhancing it, improving it as well. So the, the malware we have today is much, much smarter, much more, more potent and effective than it used to be 10 years ago. Then we have another persistent issue in our organizations, which is insufficient visibility. So um, a lot of um, institutions and organizations today don't know what's going on with their infrastructure. And this is true also for individuals. I mean, me personally, it is very hard for me to identify what kind of activities take place in my mobile. I know that um, there are uh, potential attacks on my mobile. There are people who are trying to steal my information. There is there is a lot of things going on um, around. But it's really difficult for me to track or see what's going on. So basically, the, the, most of the times, the only time we see a 
we are aware of a problem is when, when all our data is already lost. We don't get early warnings. We don't get information in advance. And this is something that can be remedied, can be fixed if the um, situation improves, basically, if the larger organizations try to help us with this and if we ourselves keep demanding that we get better and better visibility into our own machines or our own technologies. So this is something we'll discuss in the next slides as well. Uh, the last bit I want to talk about here about the uh, traditional threats is the uh, weak governance. And this is a threat because we have a lot of legal gaps in our systems. Uh, this is not unique to any country. This is everywhere. Even the most modern, the largest countries in the world have problems with legal, uh, with legalizing internet uh, activities. So um, specifically with, with social media, for example, this is really difficult. So, um, I mean, we don't have laws for so many things which are happening on the internet, including, for example, um, what if I use someone's uh, Facebook account after he dies? So I continue to use his Facebook account for the next five years. I'm selling stuff to people. I'm buying things from people. Is this a crime or not? And who defines that? And what if that person is so close to me? What if it's my father or it's my, so my very close relative? I mean, is that a crime or is it not a crime? Who can define this? How can this be handled? Is that um, an impersonation or not? So uh, usually the law is not so clear on those issues. We have to rely on archaic laws. We have to try to rely on the judge's best um, judgment in this case. But we don't have laws for it. So it's not only this, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of issues which need to be looked at from a legal perspective. We also have a problem with um, enforcement of, of policies, inform, enforcement of governance frameworks. Um, of course, Oman, like any other country, already has some uh, policies um, issued either by the Ministry of Telecommunications and, and IT or um, any other organization like Central Bank is issuing some of these, uh, the CDC is issuing some of these. So we have quite a number of policies which are issued out there, but who follows and to what extent do they follow? Is there an enforcement? Is there a punishment? Is this more like GDPR? Or is it more like PCI? Or is it more like ISO 27000? It's like we don't really have a very clear vision on these things uh, at the moment. Uh, yes, there are people pushing for this. I heard that there are some laws which are coming out this year in Oman as well for, for, for information security. And these are all good news. But uh, again, it takes too long. It's kind of slow and uh, the attackers are always one step ahead. So these are the main problems with the current, current landscape. And these are a lot of things that we have to fix over the next uh, so many years. Now, let's see what has changed uh, to make this landscape is difficult. Um, so uh, there is some noise there. Okay, thank you. So what the main problem is that protecting your digital assets is not easy. And I apologize here. I had a little bit more in this slide, but it disappeared for some reason. So why is protecting your digital assets so difficult now? Why is it not easy anymore? It's because you used to store your information in, in floppies or in hard disks or in shared folders, and that was easy, our database. That was that was easy to protect. Now, your data is there in cyberspace on some cloud systems. Your data is on the network in the inside at work. It's in your mobile, which is a system which is beyond the company's control or which doesn't have sufficient security, let's say. And of course, there is data that you store in USBs and so on and so forth. So one problem we have is that you are on multiple networks. And being on multiple networks means that we have to have control over the whole, all these networks in order to secure you. Another problem is that you have multiple devices. So not only that we have to secure your laptop or PC, but we have to secure your mobile, your watch, your every single device where you're storing data, including your USB disks. And this is not easy. Uh, for some reason, uh, I don't know. I lost the slide. Um, just give me a second. I can, we're back. So the other third problem is that uh, your data is scattered all over the place. And 
that's already related to the network. But your identity and artifacts are also scattered everywhere. They're exposed. What we mean is that you're, you're on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, you're on um, all kinds of social media platforms. Your artifacts, your videos, Mr. your... Excuse me, Mr. You are sharing the screen about MS Team, not your slide. Ah, sorry. Sharing, I don't know, to me, it's, uh, just give me a second, I'll stop. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah just... Fine. Yeah, just a, just a moment. Yeah. Yes, it, it, are, are, yeah. are we back? You can share normal? it again. Yes, we are back. Yeah, okay. Okay, so very well. So as I, I was saying, uh, your identity is scattered all over the place. Um, um, Sir Ashid, we cannot see yes. the slide. You are going to share it again. Yeah, just I think you, please. We see your your face only. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> just give me a second. I will share it again. Uh, okay. Uh, I think now we should. Uh, yeah, it, it should be on now. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Very well. Then we continue from where we stopped. Yes. Um, so I was saying that your, your artifacts are everywhere. What, why this is important? It's because if I can go to your Facebook or Twitter and I see that you have um, taken a few photos in Jabal Akhbar today, this, this morning, you and your family, you, you have your whole family there, you have your car with you, and that means that nobody is in your house. That means that your house is fair game. Anybody can, I can go and jump into your house and just steal whatever I want. Now that is a risk we can always think about, but there are other risks we're not thinking about, which are much more dangerous than this. So that very same photo that you shared on Facebook, which is just you and your family in Jabal Akhdar enjoying your time. I understand that people like to share these kind of things, but at the same time, in that picture, I realize that you have a very fancy car, maybe a Porsche or Lamborghini. That gives me a very strong reason to jump into your, your house. Second, you can have a 16-year-old daughter, and if I'm, you know, a, a predator, I can, I can. This can be a very interesting thing for me. For me, uh, I also can realize that your wife has a lot of gold. Again, it shows that you're very rich. And in the same profile, where you have shared these pictures, I can see previous pictures you shared last week. In your house, your house is so huge. It's very nice. That's good information for any thief. The house also shows in the door, it shows me the house number. And you have already mentioned that your house is in Qurum. So they, there you go. I can put two and two together. I know where your house is. I know who you are. I know where you work. I know who your family are. are. I know everything I need to know about you. So whether I am planning to steal your house today or I am planning to embezzle your, your wife or your daughter or, 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 or your son, it's easy. Khalas, everything becomes easy because you're just giving me too much information to work to, to work around with. So these are really, really huge risks that people aren't thinking about. Uh, it makes it so difficult to secure you because uh, 20 years ago, it was really difficult to know who you are to begin with, where you work. If I, I have to come and ask you, where do you work in order to know it? Today, I don't. I just need to see that you are there on social media somewhere. There are face details. There are public or open space face detection software online. I can put someone's face there and it tells me who this person is based on their social media fingerprint. In fact, I don't even need to do know that. There are today, there are even voice databases online which you can upload someone's voice and, and identify who he is. This is really crazy, and, and a lot of people aren't really looking at, at why, why spreading their artifacts will, will, will affect them, what makes them less secure. It does make them less, less secure because it informs others about what they're doing, who they are. And what. It doesn't mean that we should not use social media, but it just means we have to be more careful while, while we're using social media. Now, and again, what, what compounds this whole problem is that we rely more and more on mobiles by the day. Mobile, nobody can leave his house without a mobile anymore. 
Mobile used to be a luxury in the 1990s. Now it is an essential part of our lives. Even children have mobiles. So that is causing all kinds of problems. And it increases um, We also have a, a lot more mass surveillance systems. What, what we mean by mass surveillance or e-surveillance are platforms like Facebook, which collect thousands and thousands of bits of information about you every day. Google does the same thing. When they give you uh, Google Maps, that means they are tracking you all the time. They know where you go. They know wh how long you spend in everywhere you go. And they even can tell a lot of things about you. When did you go to hospital? What did you do there? A lot of stuff. So this mass surveillance combined with your mobile being with you all the time makes you a very easy target. If I can tap into the Facebook or the Google systems, if I can hack them somehow, then I can reach anyone in the world. And that's the power that every hacker out there is looking for. It's not easy, but it is definitely possible. And a lot of organizations, big organizations, have been attacked, like, like Sony and Apple and Google. And, you know, these are like technology companies, but they still get attacked. So we have to be really careful as individuals, knowing how weak we become, because we are exposing ourselves. And when we are not exposing ourselves, these mass surveillance systems like Google do expose us. So they give us features like face identification. They give you a face ID on, on, on Apple, for example. Uh, then in return of this, it makes your face very detectable for, to open source software. Your face is detectable. It's easy to know who you are. Uh, your pictures can be searched in Google and they can be found easily. Um, we also have data markets. As I said, deep and dark web causes a lot of issues. And um, now there is a very, very lucrative market for selling and buying soul and data. So people who used to hack you, hack your machines for their own personal gain, now they don't do it this way. They hack your machine and your brother's machine and your friend's machine. They hack everybody and they collect as much information as they can because they can go online and sell it. And you don't even know that you have been hacked and you don't even know that your information is sold. You don't know that your password is with 100 people. 100 other people have your password by now. And that is why IT always asks you to change your password every 40 minutes, 40 days, 50 days. It's because we don't really know who who's has your password. Then there is also a change in social tactics where people can target your colleagues, your employees, friends, your family members, just to reach you. I don't have to attack you directly. If you're a bank manager, I don't need to attack you directly. I can attack your brother. I can attack your um, son, right? And um, I, can, I, I can convince your son to download a game, a software. And once he downloads that into his machine, I have full control over the machine. And guess what? From there, I will see him in your connection. I uh, see you in his connections on his Facebook account, on his in his um, Yahoo account. I can hijack his Facebook account and send you a letter in his name. Send you a letter pretending I am his son. Uh, I'm, I'm your son. This is really really risky, and it, it is happening anyway today. Uh, there's a new type of attack actually happening uh, just last month. Uh, a an artificial intelligence intelligence. Um, uh, organization has, has, has announced that you can upload a file, a voice file, like you can upload my voice and then have an artificial intelligence system talk to me or call me on the phone, right, um, and mimic my voice. Uh, call, sorry, call anyone, call my brothers, for example, and mimic my voice. So you can steal my voice by just uploading a five second clip from my voice. If you can have five seconds, if you can record this session and put it online, you can easily call my brother and everything you say is going to come out in my voice, not your voice. Now, this is a very nice tool for hackers and you can think about it. So I can tell all of you, if anyone calls you claiming he is your brother, don't be so sure about it. Maybe maybe you should just shut down the phone and call him again <laughs> or try to find your brother to make sure it's him especially if the topic he's bringing is not proper. If he asks you for money or, or does anything that usually hackers do, then yes, you have to be very suspicious and careful about it. 
Then, of course, the increase in personal attacks. You can hear always about the, um, the uh, statistics coming from the MTC or the ITA in this case in the past. Um, so we used to get a lot of information, uh, a lot of statistics about embezzlement in Oman. I think last year it was around 10,000 or so, maybe plus or minus 10,000 embezzlement cases. People steal your information from your mobile and they offer to sell it or they, they embezzle you, they ask you to send money or they will spread it online. And we are a very conservative society, so it's very easy to embezzle women and children more than men. So most of these attacks are targeting women, actually. So this is also one, one issue. Uh, and once I steal, I steal data from you, I, I am definitely going to be able to either embezzle you or your, your, the people that ha you have pictures of or you have information about. So uh, it, is, it, is, it is kind of uh, bleak in this, in this regard. So all these things have changed. They, have, they are becoming more and more pressing, as I said. And we are worried about all of this. Now, um, now given the, 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 the current landscape, we need to worry about a number of issues related to the growing, growing power of technologies. AI and automation are a big problem. I just mentioned to you the example of uploading my voice and copying it easily. So the same you can do with my picture. Now you can have these deep fakes, if you hear about them, deep, deep fake videos. All you, have is a, all you need to have is a small video clip about me, and then everything you do is going to come out in my face. You can talk to others like, like me, and we can have a video session with my brother, and he will not be able to identify that that is not me. So you can copy my face, you can copy my voice, and this is really dangerous. So artificial intelligence systems are really risky. It's a risky part of... Now think about how much damage they can do if they target critical national infrastructure, like te telecom uh, infrastructure or electricity infrastructure or water infrastructure. They can disrupt a whole country. The next war, everybody's saying this, the next war is not going to be a war of weapons, it's going to be a war of IT. And if I can disrupt a country, I can disrupt water resources, I can disrupt the power, and I can disrupt the communication, then that country will be paralyzed and it will be much easier to attack in this case. So, not only this, but even attack on individuals. It is getting more and more dangerous as AI, artificial intelligence systems are becoming stronger. Add to that the improvements in, in, in quantum computing, and this is a top, it was a suggested topic actually for today, but uh, we did not want to go deeper into quantum computing because it's, it's more uh, of an international issue. It's not necessarily an interesting topic for Oman, but quantum computing is a new uh, way of doing uh, computations and, and it's very, very powerful. It is trillions of times more stronger than any machine we have today. That is, uh, true, but at the same time, it is limited in other aspects. Now, the problem with with uh, with quantum computing, if you look at it, it is much. It's going to cause. It is much easier to use it for bad stuff than for good stuff. What I mean is that you can use a quantum system to break a password in a fraction of a second. One of the most difficult passwords you can think about: uh, 128 bit, maybe 256 bit encrypted, uh, it will be broken in a second using quantum systems. And this is really, really bad, really bad. However, it is much more difficult to do anything useful with it. So you can do like um, chemical um, trials or you can do biological trials with, with, with quantum computing, but a very few people actually are looking into that. This is why I thought the, the, the security aspect of quantum computing is much, much more dangerous. Today, we are suffering with supercomputers, not quantum computers, but supercomputers, clusters. And some of these exist today, like China has quite a number of them, the US has a number of them. These are the two countries that own most of them. China has just announced last month that they have released a 1.5 exa, exa flop uh, machine. This is, I don't know, uh, 
what what you have in your uh, in your um, in your machine is just a giga flow. So the, after after giga there is tera, then there is beta, then there is exa. So this is about one million times faster than not one million one billion times faster than your machine. So that's that's really the size of 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 of, um, of supercomputers that exist today. And these are really really um, they pose a big risk not only on on us as individuals but on our systems as well. You can think about one of these supercomputers being used by a criminal gang. And this is going to be possible because today I think the cost of a supercomputer is about $100 million. If it goes down to $10 million, I think uh, criminal organizations will be able to afford it very soon. And don't forget about uh, state-sponsored attacks. So if that, is, if that is the case, then states can already afford $100 million. It's not a big issue. Uh, apart from AI and automation, we have to worry about the data onslaught, the speed upon which the data is passing from through our network. So 5G, 6G are coming. And 5G is already there. It's already here. Um, why is 5G a problem? Because um, we the used trial. to rely... Sorry? Oh, sorry. So we used to rely on our... Um, Trial Defense. version. Sorry? I, I think I have a problem with the uh, with meeting here. Okay. Uh, no problem, uh, Mr. Rashid, but it seems that some of the attendees are unmuting themselves. Uh, uh, okay. yeah, just carry on. Okay, I'll continue. Then, yeah, for the data onslaught, I was talking about 5G. So 5G can, ca can cause an issue, and 6G is definitely going to be even a more issue, more of an issue. Because we used to rely on, on having enough time to respond to attacks. If somebody attacks my firewall, I will rely on having that maybe one second or half a second in which the data has to pass from my firewall to my internal environment. And during that time, I can do quite a lot. I can do a lot of filtering. I can stop the attacks. I can identify the content. If, this, if the speed of this communication is much, much faster, then I don't have a processor which is strong enough to deal with this kind of onslaught of data. I have to change my firewall, not by any normal firewall. I'll need to have a huge, huge, strong firewall in order to allow safe communications. And even with that, I still have doubts that we can we can do it, that we'll be able to do it. Now, the only the only uh, way to deal with this for us would be to, to slow down the communications. And with, with that, we affect our own ability to progress. Other countries might allow 5G, but we will remain behind if we are not able to secure this 5G infrastructure. This is one problem that uh, I am worried about personally, but I think everyone should be worried about as well. And uh, think about a DDoS attack. Any of you who is familiar with what a DDoS attack is, it's a, it's, it's a way in which we can, we can subdue some organizations. If I hate one organization, I can send maybe... Um, 10 billion requests to its server in one second. 10 billion requests. Usually today these are, these are stoppable because my firewall is strong enough to do it, to stop it. But what if those 10 billion, instead of coming to me in one second, they come in half a second or one quarter of a second or one tenth of a second? Then it becomes a lot, a lot more difficult to stop them. I cannot. I, I have to shut down my whole network in order to stop this kind of attack, which again allows the hacker to reach their goals. If I shut down my network, that means I'm not, I'm not communicating, and that means I have been attacked. Now, again, so we, you, I hope you can see where 5G is coming in, into the picture. So the pro power of technology, again, is one of the biggest risks we have. It is proven with automation and AI. It is proven with data onslaughts. And then, finally, we have the disruptive technologies, which are making it even more complex now. Because um, in the past, the, most of the internet was visible to Google and, and, and um, uh, the other search engines, Yahoo and the others. Today, very little of the internet is visible to them. As I said, the dark web is consuming the vast majority of the cyberspace. And inside the dark web, there's a lot of things happening that we're not even familiar with. We have a lot of difficulty identifying what's going on in there. Who are the criminals? Who is selling what? How much are they paying for this? What's the size of the of the uh, hacker community? It's, it's it's just too many un, un, unanswerable questions. So if you don't know your enemy, it's really difficult to stop them. 
this is one problem that dark web is posing. We also have a problem with blockchain. Blockchain allowed for bitcoins, for, for, for uh, crypto um, currency. And cryptocurrency is allowing uh, criminal organizations to pass money without identi being identified. And this is really, really difficult. Really difficult for us to accept or live with. So now, if I if I pay one million reals in ransom, this one million reals can disappear in the internet, and nobody knows. The central bank in Oman cannot tell me where it went. The any other central bank in the world cannot tell me where this money went. It can disappear. So um, that is the problem with uh, cryptocurrencies, or with in in this case blockchain. Uh, also, blockchain can cause other other issues, not only cryptocurrencies, but there are other other matters to worry about when it comes to blockchain. Um, on the on another note, we have a problem with um, e-surveillance platforms, as we spoke earlier. So the power of Facebook, the power of Twitter, the power of TikTok is getting so big that they are taking a bigger and bigger share of our privacy every year. Um, this year, they took quite a few other um, parts of our privacy. And the problem is that there is no law. As I said, weak governance causes them to go worse by the day. So the less regulated they are, the more aggressive they become. And they're hungry for information. They're hungry for data. They, they tend to steal data everywhere. You heard about what went on in the US elections last time, 2016. Everybody still doubts that, that these big platforms had a role in this. They have been selling information about uh, different candidates in the, in the elections. This destabilizes democracy all over the world, not only in the US, but in so many countries out there. And with these countries destabilized, then we, we get less and less possibility of regulating the big uh, corporations, because the, the democratic systems generally are the ones who are fighting for any pri privacy rights, right? So autocratic systems don't fight for privacy rights. They more fi they fight mostly for, for, for other types of regulation. For privacy to have any chance, then we need a bit of democracy to take place, to still re remain in this world. So Europe and the US are mostly the, the, the biggest defender of privacy. And we are we are relying on that on that taking place in the next few years, if the the democracies remain where they are. Um, of course, not only that they affect democracy, but they affect the way we do, we do business as well. So they are disrupting uh, standard businesses. Um, it's there's no doubt that uh, um, social media platforms have affected how business is, do is done. Uh, big big platforms like Amazon have changed the way the way the business is done worldwide. Amazon is taking a bigger, bigger share. People tend to buy things online more than they buy them offline. And I mean, there is a lot going on. Even the restaurant industry has changed in Oman recently with uh, with the use of these uh, delivery uh, services, Talabat and the others. So these are all disrupting disruptive technologies. They are disrupting the way we're doing business in fintech. Financial technology in Oman, we also have a few examples. There is this, a company called Thawani, which is trying to enter the market. And I think that maybe in the next two to three years, they will start making some change in our society. As of now, they're still struggling, but I believe that these guys are on the right track. They're doing very, very well. Our society is not ready for them, that's all. But once they are ready, these people will become something. So these are all disruptive technologies that one day will really, really change the way we're doing things. They are changing what we're, what we're doing today, but they will change it even more tomorrow. So um, there are also um, socioeconomic and, and, and cultural uh, changes that are taking place uh, that are worrying, basically, as far as we're concerned. So there is an increased hacktivism. So hacktivism, to be defined to those who don't know it, Hacktivism is hacking for the purpose of raising a concern or a political motivation. So there are hacktivists worldwide. Like uh, if somebody doesn't like the uh, oil and gas industry, maybe because of environmental reasons, he can. He might try to hack Aramco or try to hack some oil company because he's trying to raise his voice. He's trying to, to tell the world, I am worried about the environment. 
well, this is not the right way of doing things, but it is it is happening and it is increasing day by day. So there are hacktivists attacking everything from government institutions to multinationals to even individuals sometimes. If they hate some artist, they hate somebody, maybe a religious figure, they will just hack him. They will just keep on attacking him. Um, so this is causing all kinds of uh, socioeconomic pressures to, to systems, to governments. And also, we should not underestimate um, what happened in the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring basically in 2011. In countries like Tunisia and in Egypt, the, the whole government was changed because of hacktivism. Mostly, there were people over there hacking into all kinds of systems or trying to use social media in a way in which it is not supposed to be used. And they keep on, they kept on, you know, pressing and on, on the system until it collapsed. So that is that is a, a huge risk and it's growing by the day. It's really difficult. It's very difficult to control the message on the Internet today. So that is one concern about socioeconomic um, or cultural changes that are taking place in our societies. We also have the Internet of Things. Uh, you keep hearing maybe about bring your own device, which is a concept that um, many organizations try to introduce in the past. They said, you know what, we want to allow our employees to bring their own uh, mobiles and watches and whatever device they want to bring. Well, it was a nice idea in the beginning, but then soon enough everybody, everybody realized, realized that this is a security nightmare. Because how do you secure a watch on Rashid's hand if, if, if we don't have control over that watch? We don't own it, we don't own the software in it, we don't have any control over it. So, and it is part of our network, so this is really, really a big problem. So, to control this, it's not that easy. There are ways to do it, but it, again, it's very costly and it's very difficult. And we have to weigh the benefits in comparison to the, um, the cost that we are um, uh, to, uh, uh, pl planning to incur for it. Internet of Things is even a, a, a bigger issue. It's a, it's a more concerning part of, of, of this technology. Um, today, we, there are companies already pushing for uh, heart implants, heart regulators or blood sugar regul regulators for diabetic patients. What this means is that we can implant a, a chip, a chip inside your heart or a chip in your bloodstream, or even for your own fingerprint, for fingerprinting, you can just put a device. The Swedish have started doing this. They've started implanting a small pill in your arm, which is identifying you. You can use it instead of your ID card or your mobile device. These are kind of, kind of dangerous because um, the, the, the implants for identification already cause a security risk and a privacy risk. But think about the heart pacers. The heart pacers mean, because that device is already connected to the internet, it has an IP. It means I can call it and I can stop it. I can stop your heart. And this is not a joke. It's, not a, it's, it's, it's a very big risk and it, 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 is, it is true when it's there. We already have medical implants which are sold actively on the in the market today. They are a little bit, I can't call them safe, but they, the companies that produce them try, um, try to, to make them as safe as possible, as usual. But again, it, it, it is a big issue that needs to be looked at from a regulatory point of view. Do we have regulations for this in Oman? No, we don't. What we have, we have maybe the Ministry of Health saying, you know, you're not allowed to have heart implants. Okay, that's one one way of dealing with it. But what about those people who need that heart implant? It's not fair also to them. So if there is a way to regulate this, let's regulate it. Let's do it in the right fashion. So that's really where the, where the worry is. The same is with sugar level regulators and so many other regulators or implants which, which can be put inside your body. Not only that, but you have all kinds of devices which can listen to you. I mean, TVs right now are being used to, to, uh, to um, uh, surveil um, different organizations, they use a CCTV kind of uh, devices in, inside your own house. That's really, really risky, really dangerous. So all these have to be um, uh, addressed. So Internet of Things is another issue. Hacktivism, Internet of Things. And finally, we have that ineffective governance we spoke about earlier. So um, the, the enforcement of regulations or policy is really, really uh, a difficult part 
in this in this part of the world, in Oman, for example, because um, to, for for this enforcement to take place, there must be a close coordination between the legal infrastructure, the, the courts and the law, legal system, and of course the um, IT regulators, for that matter. And we need to have proper committees working on uh, uh, issues like um, social media research, researching how much social media can affect our organization, our society. Uh, we have to have uh, working groups studying all kinds of impacts that the new technology is going to have on our society. And any output of these uh, working groups should be passed to the regulators to make sure that we are uh, uh, there soon enough, that we can regulate these things before they become a problem for our society. As of today, we are importing all these regulations. If you ask any organization, where do you bring your policies from? They'll tell you, oh, we are copying these from ISO 27000 or PCI or one of the international standards. But very rarely that we have a local regulation or a local policy that is designed for Oman specifically or for the Islamic world or for Arabia. You don't have anything in that regard. Mostly these are all Western, Western policies which are pushed in our societies. They work, but they're not the best for us. Uh, in terms of uh, effective governance, I could tell you quite a lot of things like um, some of them are really good regulations, like um, uh, I can mention quite a few. Um, in terms of security, for example, uh, the, French, uh, the French Parliament, as far as I know, the French Parliament has issued a regulation which forces companies like Google and Facebook to kill you online if you request that. So the right to die online is preserved in the French law today. What does this mean? It means that if somebody dies, then his children or his, inher his inher inherents have the right to request from Facebook to, to put down his page, to stop his account because the person died. In any other country in the world, it is up to Google or Facebook. Facebook might say, no, we're not closing that account. So nobody can force them to do this, but in France they can. So this is, a progress as far as the French society is concerned is something good for them. But we need stuff like that as well for us. So this is really where, where one of the uh, other problems is. Um, now, how do, we, uh, uh, how do we summarize what we, what we spoke about today? I can summarize this in two ways. One of them is that there are threats on our comfort zone or threats on our the way we're doing um, doing business right now. First of all, these uh, the, the technology disruptions, uh, the ones we spoke about earlier, like uh, bitcoins and so on, they are affecting the way we're doing business, and they will continue to affect the way we're doing business. You noticed during the COVID pandemic that education has changed. Education has gone online almost completely. This is why we're having this session online because the re reliance on online meetings has gone much, much greater in the past um, because the technology allows it and because they need as a reason for this. Uh, so education will not go back to normal after COVID. I am pretty sure that even if it goes to back to the old way of doing things, it is going to be for a short period of time. There will be calls for remote education to continue to remain and not go away. That is something we have to be ready for. Are we ready to educate our children remotely? That's one question. On another note, the way everything is done is changed. Arts, for example, um, there are new technologies. There are, uh, blockchain has allowed for original arts to be sold in electronic format. You don't, you don't need to buy a painting anymore. Last year, not last year, this year actually, somebody paid $39 million for digital art. One, one, one painting, $39 million, and that's not a proper, it's, a, it's an electronic art actually, it's not even a painting. So this is happening and uh, it is changing the way we're doing it. So artists all around the world are rethinking about taking all this canvas and paint and starting to, you know, paint things uh, around. You can also ask musicians. Uh, we don't, CDs are, don't sell anymore. It's all electronic right now. It's all MP3s sold through uh, streaming services worldwide. Things have changed a lot. Financial technology is the same thing. Um, the money transfers taking place online are 
like they're getting bigger and bigger every year. At some point, they will exceed the amount of traditional transactions. So online transactions will be will will have far more value very soon. This started a lot earlier. I mean, we started with Visa and Mastercard system, but today this went very very far. It went just beyond anybody's control. Um, Standard and reliable technologies like encryptions are at risk because of uh, quantum computing and because of supercomputing, as I said. Um, so I, I used to have a lot of trust in, in 256-bit encryption. Any technician will tell you that same. He will tell you, oh, 256 is really amazing. It's very secure. Nobody can break it. Well, that's not true, actually. There are supercomputers super out there that can do quite a lot of damage here. And there are also quantum computers which can make this even even, even much easier to break. So I, some reliable technologies like encryption, not only encryption, but we have quite a lot of them. Some reliable technologies are going to fade very soon. And the problem is that we don't have a replacement for them. If you ask me, yes, there are researches about alternative encryption methods that can trick um, it can trick um, what's called uh, quantum computers. That's true. So there are some types of encryptions which quantum computers cannot handle. I accept it, but they're not widely used anymore. Uh, yet, I mean, they're not widely used, and it'll be take a while before these 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 become common. Then we have technological supremacy, which is limited to very few entities. Very few organizations have capabilities for big data for having super computers or quantum computers in this case. So uh, we know that for quantum computers, there are only six entities worldwide which are working on this. Only six that own any proper quantum computer, today, including Google um, and some Chinese organizations and, and uh, IBM and others. So these are, these are organizations which are controlling vast amounts of data and they have huge processing powers. On top of that, they still own the quantum computers, which will make it even worse now. So Google has a lot of processing power, traditional processing. It has quantum processing capabilities, and it has a lot of data in its hands. That means it is unstoppable. It can make, it can do a lot of damage, and it has a lot of a lot more power than we should we should allow it to have. So that has to be regulated. I'm not sure who is going to do this. Then the last bit, the last part I need to speak about is. Um, there are risks on our privacy, right? So there are new concepts and initiatives taking place when it comes to um, anti-privacy, the way our privacy is broken every 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 year. And what, what that includes, uh, so the, for, for this mass surveillance, it is growing. So we used to have um, people tracking your location, geographic location, like Google or Apple. And <clears throat> we had behavioral tracking, meaning that People were looking at your clicks. They're selling these clicks online. They are looking into uh, who is sharing what on Twitter. And then there, is, there are trending information which are being sold here and there. So uh, if I know that Pepsi is trending in one group, I can ask, I can offer Pepsi to advertise and benefit from this trend. Um, and they pay me money for it. So that, that's because I have the systems. I have the ability to track what's going on in the system. So these are like more benign kinds of, um, of, of, of tracking, but there are some which are even more dangerous today. The ones where you don't even have to give your, your, um, um, your approval. Um, for, for example, um, when your fingerprint information is being sold without you uh, agreeing to it, or being shared at least, when your pictures and photos are being tagged and shared without your approving of it. What I mean here, feedback coming from CCTV can you be used, can be like, like pulled by people like Google, and they compare that to face signatures, which Google is collecting again from your use of the internet, your selfies and so on. And they can compare the two and they can tell that this video feed is about you. They can tell this is you doing something in the video. In totalitarian systems, like in China, for example, in China they're abusing this widely. They're, they're, they're human rights abusers. There are people are not safe anymore in China. The system can just pull them in five minutes. They can tell that you have been traveling last night from this town to that town because a CCTV camera on the way saw you. 
In Oman, we have these CCTV cameras on the crossroads, on the traffic lights. Now, to our best knowledge, these are used to, ident to, to, to take photos of us when we cross the traffic lights. But who says that this information cannot be abused or cannot be um, uh, used for other purposes, right? like identifying you and so on? It can be. And here comes the right, the issue of privacy. Is this part of your privacy rights or is it something that the system is allowed to do? We don't even know. There are no regulations, as I said. There is no, no nobody is studying these kind of cases and therefore nothing will happen here. We'll have to import whatever uh, the European Union or the US or some other Western nation adopts for privacy. We will take the same standard and we'll apply it in Oman. It works, but it's not really the best case scenario. Uh, unsolicited identification, this is, as I said, for facial recognition and biometrics to be shared. This is really, really risky and dangerous because um, if, um, you know, there is something called face, face tagging. Um, some of you might be using this in, 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 in Facebook and other, and other social media um, platforms. What it means that when you take a photo for you and your friends, Facebook will ask you one time, who is this and who is that? So you will say, okay, this is Saeed, that is Muhammad. From that point on, Facebook can identify Saeed and Muhammad everywhere. Whenever they have a photo, they can be identified. And that, now who has given uh, Facebook the right to identify Muhammad or identify Saeed? It's you who gave them the right, but this is not proper. They should be consulted, they should be asked. But they're not asked, and this is where the problem is now. Why would I want Facebook to identify me? Because one day, Facebook might offer to sell this information to anyone, and I'm not going to be able to stop them. I have no rights. That's where the problem is. So this is this is damage happening right now. Same is true for bi biometrics, by the way, because just by having your biometrics, I can identify that you bought a new device. If you buy a new m mobile, and then you use a different identity, like you say, I, you know, my name is not Rashid, my name is Ahmed, right? And then you put your fingerprint, now Apple knows that I am, this is Rashid, not Ahmed. <laughs> Even if you say you're Ahmed, it doesn't matter. Already, they know who you are. So this is, like, is this an infringement of your privacy? I think it is, yes, infringement of your privacy. You can't have enough privacy anymore. Uh, then, of course, unsolicited data sharing, um, the straightforward sale of data. Now, think about this. If you go to some um, hospital and then they take your information and the information says that you are diabetic, if the hospital goes and sells this information to every pharmacy in Oman, they say, you know what, I will give you the name of all the diabetes patients, all the diabetics in Oman for 10,000 reals. All the diabetics who come to my clinic, I will give you their list for 10,000 reals in your pharmacy, you can target them. You can send them an email, say, oh, we have this medicine, we have that medicine, and you will return your 10,000 reals. So this is some, some one way of being, business being done, right? And there's a lot that's taking place right now. Some of this is legal, some of it illegal. The legal parts mostly are about advertising. So again, um, companies like Twitter are selling your information to advertisers. This is for sure. This is something we know for sure, because Again, the moment you pass with your mobile, the moment you pass inside a shopping mall, a signal can be sent to that shopping mall that you are there. If that mall is paying Twitter, Twitter can inform them that you are there and it can inform them exactly which aisle, where is your location exactly, because you have allowed geotagging in your mobile. So Twitter knows where you are at that moment. It can tell the mall he is in the right wing next to a shop, a certain shop, like next to McDonald's. Then you will see an advertisement for McDonald's coming up in the next screen, the screen next to you. And you are surprised, how come these guys are, uh, how do they know that I like McDonald's? They know because Twitter told the mall, which told the restaurant. And this thing happens in a very, very short period of time. So all these are all contemporary concerns, issues related to security today, and I hope this session has been useful. I have already completed the one hour allowed for me. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them.
Thank you very much, Mr. Rashid. Please uh, make yourself unmuted if you have any question. Seems there is no the, the topic was so clear. Uh, no question so far. Um, excuse me. Is there any question? Yes. Yeah, I Dr. would like Jonathan? to ask this question. Yeah, I would like to ask this question to Mr. Rashid, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. I just uh, wondering if there is any regulation regarding cryptocurrency here in Oman. There, there is none. And um, in fact, it seems like the, there will be a ban, a, a direct ban to it uh, in Oman in the next, uh, in the foreseeable future. The reason is that uh, um, it's, there is very little use for it right now, as of now in the society. And on top of that, uh, the country here did not want to encourage um, uh, cryptocurrency, as far as I heard from the people in charge of this. So there is nothing so far, but I hear that it will be banned outright. Maybe the, the law will be issued about this year. Maybe in a few months time, there will be a clear law about it, but it will ban it, not, not allow it. So that would mean, sir, that anyone possessing any cryptocurrency will be subject for any criminal liabilities here in Oman? N not really, no. Uh, so here's the, you do it at your own risk. Basically, there will be no protections for it. That's one. Okay. The second thing is that if you, if you, uh, use cryptocurrency and you can be identified to use cryptocurrency, then the, the, the system here, the government here, will have the right to, inqu to inquire from you, what have you used that for? Right? Because we don't have visibility to, over it and the country is very, very strict in terms of financial transactions, uh, anti-fraud systems. So um, that's, that's basically as far as, as your uh, legal liability is concerned, you have to really reveal any transactions that are detectable. Chances yeah. are nobody can detect yeah. cryptocurrency. So it's kind of safe to use it from your perspective if you're doing business with the outside world. But if you're doing business inside Oman and you try to force someone to pay you in cryptocurrency or, or even offer them to pay you in cryptocurrency, then you are violating the law in this case. OK, so if any transaction done outside Oman, it will be safe. No, no, no problems with transactions. The no. problem is with transactions that are involving the change of Omani currency to cryptocurrency, meaning okay. that instead of asking him to pay in reals, you ask him to pay in cryptocurrency is not allowed in Oman. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. We'll just wait for uh, one more question because if there is any. Uh, merci. Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Rashid. I would like to inquire about, uh, you know, the payment method we are doing, uh, the top card. We are tapping only the card. Yeah. Okay. So, there, uh, I know security-wise, uh, how we, we will be encountering a lot of challenges here in terms of security because it is connected to our wireless connection, right? So the most, uh, some still, others don't want to use it. Okay, can you give us advice on this in terms of security? Yes. Um, so here's the thing that the, 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 those are very short range uh, uh, waves that can take that, uh, like the card cannot communicate beyond a few centimeters, right? So the, it was deliberately made like this. It was designed to be like this because they didn't want people to, to steal your information remotely. Mm -hmm. On another note, there are scanners, small scanners that people can put in their pockets. So if somebody comes really close to you, he will be able to read your card. 
So yes. from that perspective, yes, it is it is dangerous in, in dense locations if you're in the middle of a train station or something like that. So it can there can be a risk to your car. On another yeah. note, it is it is not straightforward, it's not that easy actually to 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 interpret the information which is sent via that card. The card is just sending certain signals. It is not sending clear information. Meaning mm -hmm. that if I am to steal money from your card, I have to understand how the bank operates to begin with. I have to understand each command and what it means. And this is yeah. unlikely unless you are being targeted by the bank's own technical people. So that's that's really where the risk is. However, um, to answer you sh in, in short, that technology is not 100% secure, but uh, it's also not um, too dangerous to use because normally you are physically limited. Nobody can force you to bring to bring out your card from your pocket. In fact, even inside your pocket, there are jammers. There are card jammers if you want. You can buy one of these. They don't cost much, maybe 100 base or so. The jammer, these jammers don't allow the scanning of the card while it's inside your wallet. So you can do that if you want, if you're worried really about, about people uh, reading your information without your consent. Uh, so in short, yes, it, 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 it is, it is uh, secure enough to, to be used, but uh, I can understand those people who don't want to uh, keep it. There is one other risk. The banks usually put a limit to, to how much can be withdrawn. Normally that limit is 50 reals per day. So it means that if somebody steals the card, physically steals your card, and he goes and he taps it in different shops, he will be able to utilize maybe 20 or 50 reals maximum. After that, the bank will stop it, and you will have the chance to go and block that card. So if your card has 1,000 reals or 2,000 reals, you're not worried about losing the 1,000. You will be most probably losing 100 or so, maybe 50 to 100 before you stop it at the, at the, in the worst case scenarios. I hope Thank you very much, sir. Uh, any more questions? It seems that we have no more questions. At the end of this uh, very interesting session on the contemporary challenges in, in uh, information security, join me please to thank Mr. Rashid Asalmi. And kindly be reminded that today's session will be available on ATC Talks uh, channel. Stay safe and have a nice weekend. Thank you, Mahfouda. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks. Ma salam Eid Mubarak. In advance. Ma salam. Thank you very much, Doctor.